Alright guys, so we're going to talk about anaphylaxis and allergic reactions, chapter 21 in your book. So if you guys want to go ahead and turn to page 629 in your book, kind of cover some cha chapter objectives and some key terms as well. As you guys know, you're going to be expected to be competent in these areas, so acknowledging that the standards are broad, general statements. Alright, so we're going to address the competencies that we see here as well as making sure that we have a good understanding of complex thought as well as critical thinking and trying the best we can to master the key terms as a student are going to give you a better understanding of the learning and be able to communicate more clearly. I want to make sure that you guys understand also the purpose of using right, these skills and how to treat your patients. Alright, so we're going to kind of talk about the allergic versus anaphylactic reactions as well as the pathophysiology of both. Kind of how we assess these patients, all right, and then talk about some of the medications we also give. So as an allergic reaction is a hypersensitivity reaction resulting from exposure to some sort of an allergen which can occur at any time and to anyone. A wide variety of substances can produce such reactions. So foods, medications, insect stings, and sometimes even exercise are common causes, believe it or not. So an allergic reaction can be a mild, localized reaction, presenting as redness, itching, skin paritis, okay, which is also a big fancy word for itching, and edema, or a mild systemic reaction resulting in widespread hives, or what's called urticaria. In most severe cases, an allergic reaction can cause a systemic, multi-system, life-threatening condition with respiratory involvement, circulatory collapse, and even shock. This severe reaction is known as an anaphylactic reaction and also known as anaphylaxis. An anaphylactic reaction is a severe, exaggerated, systemic allergic reaction that is associated with the severe swelling of the upper and lower airways, leakage of fluid from the capillaries, systemic vessel or vascular dilation, and an increase in production of mucus. An anaphylactic reaction can also be severe enough to cause upper airway closure, the respirations to become extremely labored, as well as high airway resistance from swollen and constricted bronchioles, and the blood pressure becomes dangerously low because of the dilation of the vessels and leakage of fluid from the capillaries. Delay in emergency care can easily and rapidly lead to deterioration in the patient's condition and even to death. So we've got to think, our, think to ourselves, what is the relationship between the allergic reaction and the anaphylaxis and how do the body systems respond to the allergen that result in the signs and symptoms that we see with anaphylaxis? How does the immune system play a part in this and what happens to the immune system? An allergic reaction is an abnormal reaction of the immune system to a foreign substance. This reaction can range from mild to life-threatening. The chemicals released in anaphylaxis result in swelling of the airway, bronchoconstriction, and very poor perfusion. Anaphylaxis requires a prior exposure to the antigen. An anaphylactoid reaction is similar but does not require prior sensitization to the substance. So that means you've never been exposed to it prior to this particular reaction. So penicillin, bee venom, nuts, and berries are very common causes of anaphylaxis. An antigen can enter the body through the skin, the gastrointestinal tract, or the respiratory tract. When it does, it sets off an immune response in which the immune system detects the antigen and produces what's called antibodies. Those antibodies are known or what are called proteins that search for the antigen, combine with it, and help to destroy it. An allergic reaction is a misdirected and excessive response by the immune system to that particular allergen. The allergen is usually harmless to the patient and most allergic reactions are mild, producing nothing more than a little bit of discomfort, maybe a little bit of itching, runny nose, and slight watery eyes, resulting in the body's attempt to eliminate the allergen or the antigen. Once sensitization occurs, the patient is primed for a possible anaphylactic reaction. 
it can take several exposures to a foreign substance over a long period of time to become sensitized. On your first exposure to the allergen, you produce what is known as IgE. Okay? After that sensitization, IgE antibodies attach to two types of immune cells, the mast cells, which are in the tissues, and the basophils, which are in the blood. So you can remember that by B for blood. So basophils are in the blood, okay? And mast cells or muscle, also tissue. So you can remember it that way if it makes it easier for you. When the antigen is reintroduced into the body, it attaches to the IgE antibodies that are now located on the mast cells, which are in the tissues, and the basophils, which are in the blood. Granules located inside the mast cells and basophils attach to the cell membrane, allowing them to release their contents, which are chemical substances known as chemical mediators, into the interstitial fluid. Once they are outside of the cell membrane and into the interstitial fluid, these chemical mediators can be picked up by the capillaries and transported by the blood throughout the body. The primary chemical mediator released from the mast cells, which again are in the tissue, and basophils, which are in the blood, is called a histamine. The histamine causes bronchoconstriction, vasodilation, and an increase in capillary permeability or causing fluid to leak out. After the chemical mediators are released, the mast cells and basophils regenerate the granules inside the cell membrane priming them for another allergic or anaphylactic reaction. The life-threatening response that is directly produced from the release of chemical mediators or bronchoconstriction increase in cap capillary permeability and vasodilation. These produce most of the signs and symptoms that you will see with anaphylaxis. In some reactions, the chemical mediators can be released from the mast cells and basophils the first time the antigen is introduced onto the body without the patient ever being sensitized. The antigen causes the release of the chemical mediators. Then, this reaction in which no sensitization is required is referred to as what's called an anaphylactoid reaction or a non-IgE mediated reaction. The body's responses, which is the bronchoconstriction, increased permeability, and vasodilation, are the signs and symptoms that you're looking for, which are the same as for an IgE-mediated anaphylactic reaction. Thus, your treatment is going to be the same, and determining the difference between the two doesn't make a difference in the field because both are treated the same way. Some of the common things as how allergens can enter the body is just like with poisonings. It can be or overdosing or drugs, injection, infusions, okay, ingestion, inhalation, or contact. Okay, injection, especially intramuscular or intravenous injection, is the route most often associated with anaphylactic reactions. Penicillin is the most common medication that causes anaphylactic reactions. Hemenoptera account for the majority of severe allergic reactions and anaphylaxis related to insect bites. Venom from insect bites or stings, especially from millipedes, caterpillars, and centipedes, most often cause only a localized reaction. However, foods including peanuts, other nuts, milk, eggs, shellfish, whitefish, food additives, chocolate, cottonseed, and berries cause anaphylactic reactions in some people also. Pollen from plants, especially ragweed and grasses, can cause anaphylactic reactions. Mediations, including antibiotics, local anesthetics, aspirin, seizure medications, muscle relactants, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, such as ibuprofen or Aleve, and vitamins are known to cause anaphylactic reactions in some, per in some people. Insulin and tetanus and diphtheria toxoids can also produce anaphylactic reactions. Many other substances, for example, glue, hair dye, nickel, henna tattoos, and transfused blood can produce rare anaphylactic reactions in some patients. Exercise can accentuate the anaphylactic response when certain foods have been ingested close to the time of exercise. This condition is most common in dedicated athletes such as joggers, 
but rarely also occurs from physical activities such as raking leaves or dancing. Weather conditions, including heat, cold, and humidity, can trigger an anaphylactic reaction. Latex is most often found in the examination gloves and other medical devices. An anaphylactic or anaphylactoid reaction can be triggered by many substances. If you're following along in your book, chapter 21, table-1, the most common cause is medications that are either taken orally or injected, and you can refer to this list here of some common ones that you're going to see in the field. During your scene size-up, you must be certain that your own safety is not in jeopardy, especially if the anaphylactic reaction is the result of a bite or a sting. You might encounter a patient who disrupted a yellow jacket or wasp nest and was stung several times. The yellow jackets or wasp can still be at the scene and will attack when you exit the ambulance, exposing you to the risk of an anaphylactic reaction from the stings yourself. If you detect the presence of many wasps or yellow jackets, you might have to wait until they settle or disperse before approaching the patient. Because so many different substances can cause an anaphylactic reaction, the scene size up might not provide any obvious clues as to the nature of the illness. Make sure you assess your patient for signs and symptoms of airway obstruction, impaired ventilation, and poor perfusion. So again, your primary assessment, airway, breathing, circulation. A patient with a history of anaphylaxis may have a prescribed EpiPen auto-injector with them. Epinephrine helps the patient with anaphylaxis by causing vasoconstriction, bronchodilation, and improving cardiac output. In gathering your general impression of your primary assessment of a patient with an anaphylactic reaction, you might note that the complaints of not feeling well or of a malaise or what's called generalized weakness or just a generalized feeling of discomfort. Such a patient can display a sense of impending doom. He may also complain of difficulty swallowing or itching or tightness in his throat. The patient's mental status can also be anywhere from continuum from responsive and alert to responsive but disoriented to completely unresponsive all the way. Closely make sure that you assess the airway for signs of obstruction. Strider, hoarseness, or crowing sounds indicate significant swelling to the upper airway. Inserting an airway adjunct might not help relieve the obstruction if the swelling is at the level of the larynx. You might also find a swollen tongue that interferes with the airway also. It might be necessary to provide positive pressure ventilation to force the air past the swollen airway. It might also, you might also find a swollen tongue that interferes with your airway, so wheezing can be prominent upon assessment of breathing. If a patient is severely disoriented, unresponsive, or breathing inadequately, immediately begin positive pressure ventilation with supplemental oxygen. If the breathing is adequate, provide supplemental oxygen if any signs of respiratory distress, poor perfusion, hypoxemia, or hypoxia are present. Okay, maintain an SpO2 reading of 94% or higher. Also, realize that your patient is going to become restless when hot signs and symptoms of hypoxia present. The pulse is in a patient suffering from an anaphylactic reaction can be weak and rapid. The radial pulse might not be present because of the low blood pressure. Edema or swelling may can be obvious in the face, neck, lips, tongue, hands, and feet. The skin can be red and warm, or the patient's skin can be cyanotic from inadequate breathing. You might notice hives, raised red blotches all over the skin. Okay, this is what's known as angioedema from an anaphylactic reaction. And then here we have hives, which are usually accompanied by severe itching. Hives or urticaria accompanied by itching, which is known as pruritus, are all hallmark signs of symptoms of an allergic reaction. Some of the early noticeable signs of an anaphylactic reaction may be nonspecific, so such as rhinitis, which is known as a stuffy, runny, itchy nose, fast heart rate, which is tachycardia, itching that is localized or diffuse, which is pruritus, or faintness or lightheadedness. Additional early noticeable signs of anaphylaxis 
which are also nonspecific, can be a warm, flushed skin. Okay, skin can maybe appear pale. Agitation or anxiousness, which can also go with hypoxia, urticaria or hives, edema, which is swelling of the skin, and other tissues such as the lips and tongue, which is known as angioedema. Because of the potential seriousness of an anaphylactic reaction and its effects on the airway, lungs, blood, vessels, and heart, the patient is considered a priority and should be prepared for immediate transportation. Before you leave the scene, determine whether the patient has a prescribed EpiPen, okay, and then inquire of relatives or any bystanders if the patient is unresponsive. Here's some signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and related pathophysiology accompanied with, oh, with each. So please follow along in your book, turn to this page, and utilize this chart to study some of the different signs and symptoms and pathophysiology of the causes of the signs and symptoms. We're into our history taking. The secondary assessment should be conducted whether the patient's signs and symptoms indicate a mild, moderate, or severe allergic reaction. However, if the patient exhibits signs of severe reaction, do not delay transport of the patient to complete the secondary assessment. Make sure you obtain a good sample as well as a good OPQRST. Time is critical with these patients, so generally the more quickly the reaction develops, the more severe it's going to be. We got to think to ourselves, are the signs and symptoms consistent with an anaphylactic reaction? Do the signs and symptoms indicate a mild, moderate, or severe reaction? Are the signs and symptoms getting progressively worse or better? And is the patient experiencing dyspnea or chest pain? Patients sometimes complain of shortness of breath and chest pain prior to other signs and symptoms occurring. Does the patient have a history of allergies to specific foods, medications, plants they may have been around? Have they been stung by an insect recently or bitten by something? Prior anaphylactic reaction to a particular substance, and if so, to what? Does the patient have a prescribed EpiPen? Has the patient taken any medications to relieve the current signs of symptoms such as some oral Benadryl or any other kind of oral caffeine? or anything that can, they have tried themselves to try to reverse the effects of the anaphylaxis. Right? What other medications are you taking and is there any new medications that were recently prescribed that could be causing this reaction? Does the patient take any kind of a beta blocker that could be masking some of the signs and symptoms that are typical of an anaphylactic reaction? If the patient is taking a beta blocker, their response to the epinephrine could be limited. So you might not see a spike in blood pressure or heart rate given the beta blocker is blocking that effect. Has the patient suffered an anaphylactic reaction in the past? How severe was the last reaction? Does the patient have any other significant illnesses? That's part of your pertinent past medical history. Your L, for sample, last oral intake. When was the last time the patient had anything to eat or drink? When did he recently eat or drink? This can be pertinent with an anaphylactic reaction to determine if they were allergic to anything that they ate. And how much of it did they actually eat? Could help determine the severity that the reaction may have. What were you doing prior to this? Okay. What was the patient exposed to that might have caused the anaphylactic reaction? Were you running a marathon and happened to brush past some poison ivy or poison oak or inhaled something that you ran by? Checking on your skin for your circulation, warm, tingling, feeling in the face, mouth, chest, feet, and hands. Intense itching, especially of the hands and feet. Hives, flushed or red skin, swelling to the face, lips, neck, hands, feet, and possibly even the tongue. And is there any cyanosis present? Checking on the respiratory system under your secondary. Are there any complaints of a lump in the throat to indicate the patient's throat might be swelling up. We're going to check the chest, see if there's any tightness in there. Do we hear any high-pitched coughing or wheezing? Is the heart rate increased or breathing rate increased? Is there any impaired ability to talk or any hoarseness, any strider or crowing that we might hear? Excessive amounts of coughed up mucus, partially or a complete occluded airway, and is there any difficulty in breathing? 
Now we're going to move on to the cardiovascular system when we're checking going through our secondary assessment, just in our medical assessment. Do we have an increased heart rate? Do we have a dropped blood pressure? Is the pulse irregular? Absent radial pulse, which means they're in severe shock. Check in the central nervous system. Do they have any increased anxiety? Are they lightheaded, unresponsive? Is there any disorientation? Does the patient appear restless to, com to confirm a diagnosis of hypoxia? Does the patient have any seizures, any headache? Moving down to the GIGU. Any nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, any diarrhea? Has the patient had any difficulty in swallowing? Any loss of bowel control? GU. Urgent need to urinate. Any cramping in the uterus or in the stomach? Generalized signs and symptoms. Itchy, watery eyes, runny or stuffy nose, sense of impending doom, complaints of not feeling well, generalized weakness or discomfort. Assess the vital signs, paying attention to the breathing, pulse, and blood pressure. The respiratory rate can be beyond the normal limits. Early in, in an anaphylactic reaction, you might find that the respiratory rate is fast and labored. As the condition progresses and the patient begins to get tired, the breathing can become slower than normal and shallow. Wheezes can be heard without a stethoscope. The breathing can also sound noisy with a rattling sound on inspiration and exhalation from the excessive mucus in the larger lower airways. The pulse is rapid and can be weak. In severe cases of anaphylaxis, the radial pulse can be absent or extremely weak. Unlike other types of shock, the skin is usually red, dry, and warm to the touch. Hives and itching are the most common complaints in all types of allergic reactions. Mild, moderate to severe. And hypotension is extremely, extremely common in a severe reaction. We have to figure out, do we distinguish, is this a systemic or is this a localized reaction? And the treatment's going to depend on our distinction between the two. A local reaction typically does not require aggressive intervention or administration of medication by us. In a patient with a local reaction, you can maintain adequate oxygenation and transport the patient while constantly assessing for signs and symptoms of a systemic reaction indicating that this is converting over to an anaphylactic reaction. Epinephrine should be administered to patients with signs and symptoms of a systemic reaction, especially if they present with low blood pressure, respiratory difficulty, or upper airway swelling. Your major concern is that the mild local reaction can rapidly progress to a moderate to severe or anaphylactic reaction. Always be prepared to manage the worst case scenario and continuously reassess the patient's condition. Maintain a patent airway. The patient might initially present with airway compromise associated with swelling of the tissues lining the larynx because airway adjuncts are not effective in managing the obstruction. You might need to force air past the swollen tissues by positive pressure ventilation. If using a bag valve mask device, you might find it much harder to compress the bag to deliver the contents. Suction any secretions. In the severe anaphylactic reaction, heavy secretions can be present. Clear the mouth of any secretions by suction when necessary and maintain adequate oxygenation. If the, vital, if the vitals that are hypoxia and hypoxemia are reversed and adequate oxygenation is maintained, the patient can have breathing, adequate breathing as well as a high concentration of oxygen should be ministered by the non-rebreather mass to maintain a SpO2 of 94% or greater and to try to eliminate the signs of hypoxia. Be prepared to assist with ventilations. Patients with a mild allergic reaction might not exhibit any respiratory distress during the length of their contact. However, a patient's condition can progress rapidly over minutes or more slowly over hours and eventually produce severe respiratory distress. Have your ventilation equipment ready and pre be prepared to begin BVM ventilations if necessary. We're going to give an EpiPen or an epinephrine injection in any patient with signs and symptoms of severe systemic of anaphylactic reaction, especially when the patient presents with low blood pressure, respiratory distress, or upper airway edema. Obtain an order for medical direction to administer epinephrine. 
This is, this is typically done by an epinephrine auto-injector. 